sickle cell disease. All right, we see lots of patients with sickle cell disease. This is a terrible disease. It's a disease of a lifetime. You know, recently we've been reading about these stem cell transplants for patients with sickle cell gene therapy, which are some really important options and very exciting new possible therapies for patients who suffer from this very painful and devastating disease. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease that gives you a chronic hemolytic anemia. So these patients run at a baseline hemoglobin somewhere in the six to nine range. They also are pumping out reticulocytes like crazy to try to compensate for this anemia. So if you check the reticulocyte count, you should see that they have a reticulocyte, reticulocyte count somewhere in the 5 to 15 percent range as their bone marrow is trying to keep up with the anemia that they suffer from. They often have cardiac and respiratory dysfunctions. They're routinely ecteric from the chronic anemia that's going on and the breakdown of those heme products into bilirubins. They often have elevated bilirubin, and they have splenomegaly and splenic and infarction, and they often have autosplenectomy from all of these sickled cells gathering in the spleen and causing all kinds of problems, so that's pretty normal for them as well. This is a genetically inherited disease, so you see if the parents each carry a trait and they were to have four different children, this can sort out in various different ways. But if you're the unlucky one who inherits both of the genes, then you're going to be having sickle cell disease. Those are the people who are all in blue. They've inherited the gene from each parent. They got both copies. They have full-blown sickle cell disease. Now, there are people in the middle who inherited one gene and basically carry the trait. They have the gene, and they may have some kind of partial effects, but then there's other people who may have parents who have the trait, but because of how genes sort out, they could have no blood disorder whatsoever. So it just depends on the genetic lottery that happens with you and your parents, whether they carry this particular gene or not. Now, why do people who have sickle cell have these vaso-occlusive crises? Well, they have these sickled RBCs that are a funky shape, and so these gather in the microcirculation, they cause obstruction, they cause problems with viscosity, so the patient gets ischemic pain from the sickling, from the blockage of flow, and infarction in different ways, shapes, and forms. There are precipitants of this, certainly people who have infections, they're exposed to cold, dehydration, they go up in altitude, they exert themselves, all kinds of things can trigger one of these sickle crises. And the most common manifestation is pain. That's what they come in with. And that's real pain from ischemia. These sickle cells are bunching up, causing this ischemic pain to muscles, to bones, to different parts of their body. Abdominal pain, obviously, can happen as well. And they can have diffuse peritoneal signs, can be sudden onset. And it, they don't forget that people with sickle cell could also have an appendicitis. So you could be basically tossing around several different di uh, diagnoses on your list, but it could be anything from the typical causes of acute abdomen to a sickle crisis. That can happen in any part of the body. So in terms of RBC sickling, there's all kinds of consequences. You've got these sickle cells that get destroyed, leading to anemia, which leads obviously to things like weakness and all these other problems. You get the clumping of the sickle cells, which also causes impaired blood supply to the various organs, causing damage to these different organs that are listed here in the blue. And then you've get also these, these sickle red cells concentrating in the spleen, causing the spleen to enlarge and fibrose and ultimately autoinfarct. And so all of these things lead to at the bottom, you see, in increased mortality. And so the lifespan of patients who have true sickle cell disease, they live somewhere in their 40s on average. That's terrible. That's a terrible life-limiting disease with all kinds of consequences to them. So just an awful, awful disease. Some of the specific vaso-occlusive crises that you need to know about in emergency medicine is acute chest syndrome is one of the things that we think about when patients with sickle cell come in with chest pain, shortness of breath, et cetera. This is one of the leading, the leading cause of death, most common cause of hospitalization in adults with sickle cell is this particular syndrome as they get an infiltrate in their lungs, usually a lower uh, segment of their lung, presenting with chest pain and fever. They can be nictitic, they can be wheezing or coughing, and obviously on the different differential for this besides acute chest syndrome would be pneumonia because they are often without a spleen, are suspect, are likely to get encapsulated organism infections. So that's something that could be happening too. So the differential is quite broad. Um, and so, you know, often we admit people with something else and they end up having acute uh, chest because of the vaso-occlusive crisis. So um, often the cases are they got admitted for their musculoskeletal pain or some other reason and the acute chest may even develop while they're in the hospital. <clears throat> and this can happen a couple days into the hospitalization. So not only do we see it present in the emergency department, but it's something that can also present and worsen while they're in the hospital. 
So again, the causes could be that it starts with an ammonia and then leads to the vasoocclusive crisis. It could also infarct lung as well. You can have fat embolism or even a combination of these things as well. How do we treat these patients? Certainly if they're wheezing, if they're hypoxic, we're gonna give them oxygen. They can often have hypoxia out of proportion to the disease. We're gonna start them on antibiotics because it may be a pneumonia, it's the chicken or the egg that come from this. So uh, antibiotics, of course, including a macrolide. And then we're gonna make sure if we are admitting a patient with sickle cell that we're doing incentive spirometry to try to prevent this as much as we can. Lots of hydration and pain management are the things that we can do as well. And bronchodilators might be helpful. Even if they weren't wheezing, you might consider trying that to promote uh, blood flow and good aeration of all the alveoli. And if they really had acute chest syndrome and were in trouble, think about things like exchange transfusion as an ultimate therapy for patients with sickle cell who are really sick in lots of different ways. Exchange transfusion, meaning that you're taking out those sickle red blood cells and trying to infuse them with healthy red blood cells to promote better circulation. There are other types of vasoocclusive crises of other critical organs, as you can imagine, that we have to also think about. Certainly CNS crises, this is why kids with sickle cell can get strokes at very, very young ages. Awful, awful thing to have happened. They can have intracranial hemorrhages, TIAs, seizures, paresthesias, all as a result, again, of this sickling and poor perfusion leading to poor perfusion of the CNS. Renal crises, they can have renal infarctions, hematuria, flank pain, necrosis of their papilla, those kinds of things as well. And then they can get dactylitis or hand foot syndrome, which happens in the early part of a sickle cell, a patient with sickle cell, early part of their life, where they basically get avascular necrosis and swelling of their hands and feet as these small digits suffer these microcirculatory problems. It may be one of the first signs that they actually truly have sickle cell disease. And you see a picture of that, what it looks like here. And then priapism is a problem with sickle cell, because again, in the microcirculation of the penis, you get basically this sort of gumming up and then you have outflow problems and so you can also have bad priapism here. Exchange transfusion is on the list of therapies for priapism in patients with sickle cell as well as the typical aspiration and phenylephrine injection that can be tried that we, that we use in regular, regular folks as well. Other crises that could happen in patients with sickle cell, splenic sequestration. This is the second most common cause of death in children who have sickle cell disease. This is, starts with an infection, often maybe a pulmonary infection. Lots of sickling happen. Their spleen basically explodes with all these sickle cells, and then they get hypovolemic, hepatomegaly, hepatosplenomegaly as well. We want to treat this with, in, with transfusions, and particularly exchange transfusion, another life-threatening sickle cell disease where exchange transfusion may be the answer. And then ultimately, what happens when those reticulocytes don't keep kicking out? And that is when patients go into aplastic crisis. So the marrow is no longer generating the reticulocyte. You've got the anemia that's basically going unchecked. And so the reticulocyte count is low. That's why we often check it. If they're anemic, we want to see that they're pumping out retics to make sure that they're actually trying to keep up. But when that reticulocyte count drops, oh boy, that's a problem. Now we've got anemia and no gas coming to the engine afterwards. So this can happen from certain types of infections like parvovirus infecting the bone marrow and then kicking off this aplastic crisis or if their folate levels have dropped as well because they're chewing up folate all the time. This can often just be self-limited if we can supplement them, get them through it, things can resolve. For example, if this parvovirus infection gets resolved, you can imagine that this could get better as well. Patients with sickle cell are at very high risk for infections. And again, this is another leading cause of death, especially in kids under age five, because they have this functional asplenia, which puts them at risk for encapsulated organisms. Things like pneumococcus, salmonella, H. flu, you see the list here. We're thinking also about influenza, parvovirus, all of these things in an anemic patient that's got these, you know, this relatively poor perfusion going on all the time. They're at much higher risk for the complications of these infections. So that Vaccines are certainly important for them, but often just think about covering these particular types of uh, bacteria when patients with sickle cell get infections. So vaccines are super important for them. And if you suspect an infection, have a very low threshold for antibiotics since they are at risk for those. In terms of patients who come in with sickle cell crisis, obviously hydration can help kind of get flow going through the clogged traffic ways of sickle cell crisis, analgesics, oxygen to help with that, delivery of oxygen to these poorly perfused areas of the body, transfusions have indicated if their anemia is particularly bad, and considering emergent exchange transfusion for the life-threatening sickle cell complications. And then antibiotics is something that's often on the list since we are 
considering infection and loss of the different presentations. But I think that exchange transfusion for the purpose of tests is important. It could certainly be a choice for you. It's not something that I would choose for a routine sickle cell pain crisis. It's for the life-threatening ones. So they might get you to bite on something like that. Know that it's reserved for the life-threatening complications of sickle cell.